This scripture lesson this morning is from Hebrews chapter 4, 12 through the 16th verse. God means what he says. What he says goes. His powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, having us open to, he, to listen and obey nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it, no matter what. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let up, slip it through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experiencing it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Harry. We have some young folks here today. Do we have anybody able to teach today? Yeah, Kim, you guys want to go to junior church? Go do something something even more fun? <laughs> Notice I said more fun? It's like you're having a blast already, right? <laughs> well, how was your week? I I hope it was better than mine. <laughs> It's good to be back and in person. It's good to feel like a human being again. Um, uh, it, it's hard to, to battle that, uh, that feverish state. It was hard to, to stay away from, uh, like I know my mom was wanting to go to Florida with Sherry uh, to see Justin and Danny and, and little Charlotte. And uh, I was like, I've got to stay away from them because I can't, I can't give it to them. So... Uh, you noticed the last couple weeks, you had me on video, but uh, that was my closet door in the background. So I was literally kind of makeshift setting up and, and going through the motions. And um, last, last Friday uh, night is when I recorded last Sunday's message. And uh, somebody was talking about it, and they were like, yeah. I was like, because I had to find a time when I felt good enough to do it um and it was obviously a short message last week and that was that was about all i had in the tank um you know 10 minutes or so maybe right it was about all i had in the tank and um somebody goes well you looked really good and i was like yeah for that 30 minutes that it was part of me doing that that was about it that was all i had that was that that was all of it so whatever you face this week i hope you did so with grace i hope you did so with strength and I hope that you were staying in touch with God. I have to say, after 10 days of wondering whether or not I was going to make it, right? Because at times you get into that spot where it's like, this is never going to go away. Um, God's the only thing that I had left. It's the only thing I could hold on to. It's the only thing that was tangible for me at that moment. And so as I struggled and held on and held on, he never left. And I stayed in communication with him. I stayed in contact with him. He continued to... to preach into me, right, and to speak to me. And I hope that's what you continue to do on a daily basis. Now, we started this uh, series from Hebrews. This is straight out of the lectionary. started it last week. I know it was kind of strange, and you got a, a video version of it. But Jesus the priest is a very strong theme in the book of Hebrews. Almost every chapter at some point speaks about Jesus being the high priest. Now, in order to understand that, we have to understand that the high priest was, uh, it was, it was given by God. And this is in the time of the tabernacle, uh, the time of uh, Moses. This was all these things that were set in place for worship, not only worship, but then the forgiveness of sins. So you had to bring that offering to the high priest. The high priest then would take it to the Holy of Holies, sacrifice it, and you would be covered and your sin would be forgiven. Now, in doing that, 
it was a never-ending process because there was never anyone holy enough. Not only were they not holy enough, even as priests, they were human beings, right? There were, there were faults in everybody, in all of us. And so you have this possible moment where Jesus then becomes the once forever sacrifice for the sin of man. Never to, it has, no, never has to be repeated again, right? We don't, we don't bring our animals with us to sacrifice, you know, here on, on an altar. Uh, it doesn't have to happen that way anymore because of Jesus. And so we, as we break down, though, what all of these characteristics of this priest are, we talked last week, and it was about being perfect, the perfect leader is what we talked about last week. Jesus being that perfect, unblemished uh, leader who not only was good at leading, but was knowledgeable. I mean, you're talking about God in human form. There was nothing that was going to be a mistake. We, we talk about it even in, this, even in today's text. It goes back to talk about the perfectness of Jesus, that he understands us because of the weaknesses, the things that, the trials he had to face, and yet he was without sin. Today's text kind of flows in a, in a cause and effect kind of, in a, kind of a way. And, and, and we find out if we look at the beginning, we go back to verse 12, we see that God and God's word is powerful and alive. And I think that it's, it's interesting to understand if we go back into the book of John, John identifies Jesus as the word. He is the word of God. That's how God's word is expressed, is through this living being of Jesus. And he even says, you know, in the beginning, the word was God, the word was with God, and all things were together, right? And so he describes Jesus as being the word. Now in today's text, we go to see that for the word of God is alive and powerful. So what does that mean for us? It means that the word is Jesus, and Jesus is alive and powerful. He is not dead. It's not blank, black and white letters on a page. It's alive. It's a being. It's a person. And he is alive sitting at the right hand of God. Now, with that meaning, that meaning is now that the risen Christ is still working, still doing and still our priest. I know it sounds weird, but he's not dead. He's very much alive. And, and if Jesus is alive, that means the word of God is alive. And over the course of thousands of years, I want you to wrap your brain around this. This, is, this was me stuck in, in study land and in thought processes, right? And thinking about God. Uh, over the course of thousands of years, Jesus is still powerful and still alive and still present. Think about that for a minute. Think about how many thousands of generations of people have heard the message of Jesus and been changed, saved, or healed. When we look at history, we see where even after Jesus' death and resurrection, people are using Jesus' name. They are causing demons to tremble. They are making illnesses cease. And they are bringing strength to people with the name of Jesus. It's incredible. It's still happening today. Like we, we got up this morning and we came to this place to worship together because of Jesus. I mean, that's literally why we're here. The, t the text states that the, that the word, and I loved the way, uh, the way uh, Harry's translation described it as, as a surgeon's scalpel, right? That, that, wow, what a visual, right? Separating, and, you know, in, in my text it said separating soul and spirit between joint and marrow, you know, getting that visualization of the word of God separating the good of you from the bad of you. The text states that it cuts and it is exposing our innermost thoughts and desires. And in other words, God knows us. I know it's scary. It's hard to think about that. 
But this is a God who knows you. So much so that he knows your innermost thoughts and desires. So what do those innermost thoughts and desires look like? Right? Not only was he instrumental in our creation, but he sees us as valuable parts of that creation. That was kind of why in our prayer time I was like, you know, God, we don't see you the way that you see us. And in vice versa, right? We see a sunrise and many of us just go, wow, that's beautiful. Uh, some of us maybe may go deeper and go, wow, God is incredible. I mean, he literally set all of these pieces in place so that that sun would rise on this morning through those perfect set of clouds that it would look so perfect and beautiful. And yet what we don't understand is when we rise in the morning and we begin to start our day, we start it with prayer, we start it with joy, we start it with the realization that Jesus is alive and God looks at us in that same way. Like how beautiful is this creation of mine? Look at how amazing they are. They're brilliant. They're wonderful. I think as God was thinking about each one of us, that is what held him together as he had to watch his son Jesus go to a cross and die for us. If it wasn't for us and how much God loved us, he would not have had to do that with his son. You go on to verse 13, and we realize that there's nothing in creation, all of creation, that is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one whom we are accountable. <laughs> he, he is saying that nothing you have done is hidden from him. Now, I want you to go back, and I want you to look at your life. The mistakes, right? The shortcomings, the decisions that weren't the greatest. And you realize that this God sees all of that. He sees all of that about each of us. And yet, even in the midst of knowing our weaknesses and knowing our faults, he still sent his son to die for us. And not only that, but he is still looking for us. Do you remember the story of Adam and Eve? This creation is perfect. It's, it's the only thing that has free will, right? It's the only thing that can worship me by choice. And here I say, do anything you want. You are in control of all of this stuff. Just don't eat from that tree. And Adam and Eve, they go and they eat from that tree, which separates them from God. It separates that perfect relationship. God still was looking for them, Right? Even in the midst of their failure, God was the one that was looking for them, and they were the ones that hid. Why? Guilt? Shame? God's like, where are you? Not like he doesn't know where they are. And they're like, well, we are hiding. We're naked. And God says, well, who told you you were naked in the first place? And yet, even in the midst of the very first sin in the world that separated God from this creation, God was still looking for them. He's still reaching out for them just like he's still reaching out for us. And Jesus, the word, becomes flesh. Not only because he loves us that much, but because he's looking for us and desires such a relationship with us, he found a way in order to sacrifice his son, the one great high priest, that we would be saved from that sin, our relationship would be restored, and we would get to experience a renewal of that relationship. I know it's a lot to wrap your head around on a Sunday morning, right? <laughs> and so the author of Hebrews, likely Paul or someone that was with Paul, says, so then, right, this is, the, this is the, the effect part of the cause, right? God's the great creator of all things. He, he loved his creation enough. He knows everything about us, even all of our faults and our mistakes, and yet still wants to desire a relationship with us because of Jesus. So then, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has entered heaven, 
let us hold firmly to what we believe. This is a call to hold on. This is a call to believe it more. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He faced all the same things we do, and yet he did not sin. Our priest, the word, Jesus, offered himself up in our place for the atonement of our sin. Now, I'll talk about it a little bit later in more detail, but the, the atonement for sin process was to go to the priest. Jesus now becomes the atonement for our sin in a one-time, forever process and moment. There are many places in Scripture where we can see the human side of Jesus, how difficult it was for him, how hard it was, I'm sure. And becoming one of us, it's not only was it now possible for God to atone for our sin one time, but now God knows and understands us. He now has a grasp on understanding this creation that, that, that is made to be perfect and yet flawed. And Jesus, facing all of the same tests and trials that we do, never wavered. He never fell short. He never had a change of heart. He never failed. He bled. And he died on our behalf, even knowing what, who we would become and the decisions that we would make in our lives. That's how much God loves you. This is why we should hold firmly to believing this. Because this is an unwavering hope in eternity that Jesus brings us in spite of us. In spite of our decisions and in spite of our choices. Our unwavering hope should be in this man, Jesus. Because of his amazing work. And our understanding now of what this priest has done on our behalf, we should not have a fear of going into the presence of God. I, I love verse 16, in which he states that we should come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us. Many of us spend a lifetime believing that God is judging us. Right? We probably might have been raised that way. Oh, don't do that. That's bad. God's going to get you. Right? This, this feeling that, that, oh, man, I can't, I can't live that way. I want to live my life because, you know, I don't want to be constantly afraid. And God's not like that. That's not the God that, that we see in Scripture. And what we miss the most <clears throat> excuse me, is that God already knows the things that you're going to do. He knows the choices that you're going to make, and yet he loved you enough to send his son to die for you anyway. That should give us a moment of grace. It should give us a, a peace and a joy to know that so that we will go to him and be in that relationship with him. It says we should come boldly to the throne. We should never be afraid to run into his arms. We should never be afraid of what we think the consequences are going to be. We should never feel that we, are, that we don't belong. We should never feel less valuable than we are. You've heard me say this before. Wherever you are today in your life, there is nothing that you can do that will make, you, that will make God love you less. There's also, though, nothing you can do that will make God love you more. This is his abundant love and grace, and it's poured out on us every day, all the time. In God, we find mercy. In God, we find hope. In God, we find grace. All available to us to help us when we need it most. God did not send his son so that he could be this once forever great high priest so that we would feel inadequate. We are inadequate. We're a flawed, failed creation, right? We're broken. That's not why God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus so that we would understand that we have value, that we are not a failure, and that there is hope in this eternity. The Jesus that came 
is what love looks like. It's what God looks like. That we would desire to be in a relationship with a God who loves us because it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter where we've been. He simply wants that relationship with us. So how can our understanding of this priest and how can the understanding priest in Jesus give us hope today? How can you and I rise from this place place with a faith so bold that we are capable of running to the throne of God, sitting at his feet where Jesus is there, and we can be alive. We can, be, we can receive that power. We can understand that he loves us. We can understand that we have the capability and that love is reigning supreme. Amen. Join me as we offer up.